now. Chapter 6 Riley did what she'd always done best. She ran. She turned and escaped from the room, grabbed the door handle and fled out the front door, realizing as soon as she did that she'd forgotten her coat, and that's where she'd slipped the keys to the rental car. No way was she going back inside that house. Instead, she sprinted past the car and down the street, not even noticing the temps outside until she slowed down to a brisk walk. She hadn't even felt the tears streaming down her cheeks until she was struck by how cold her face was. Her sweater and jeans were no match for the frigid evening temperature, and once her flushed anger ebbed, she realized she was freezing. She stopped, automatically shoved her hand into her jeans, then rolled her eyes. She'd slipped her cell phone in her coat pocket, too. She had no one to blame for this fiasco but herself. She'd acted like a child in there, tossing accusations and arguing with Ethan, just like she had with him before she'd run out of town ten years ago. She had a right to be angry at Ethan. The things he'd said to her were unforgivable. What she should have done was stand her ground and tell him exactly what she thought of him, but no, she'd had to play the victim and run out of the room all hurt. The running part she was really good at. Old hurts and angers. Some things didn't change, and some hurts could never be repaired. If she was smart, she'd turn around, go back to Ethan's house and suck up the embarrassment, grab her coat and keys and drive home. It was over a mile walk back to the bed and breakfast, and she was not dressed for that. But damn it, he'd hurt her, and she would not go crawling back there. She had her pride, and she refused to humiliate herself any further. It wasn't like she was going to die in a mile. Uncomfortable, yes. Dead, no. She'd send someone over for the car and her coat tomorrow. Shivering, it didn't take a block and a half before her ears began to sting, and she was certain her toes were going to end up with frostbite. What was the temperature outside, anyway? Okay, maybe a mile in this cold was a little far. When the first snowflakes started to fall, she laughed. Perfect. Dumb, Riley, really. Next time you decide to storm off in a huff, grab your coat first. She saw headlights and wondered if it was someone she knew. She was so cold she'd offer up an autographed guitar to whoever drove her back to the bed and breakfast. The car slowed and pulled to the curb. She stilled when the window rolled down. It was Ethan. Riley, get in. She thought for all of a quarter of a second about telling him to stick it, but she wasn't that stupid. She was freezing, and she was certain she'd lost a few brain cells— she shuffled her frozen body to the car and slid inside. Thankfully, he had the heater blasting, and her coat was on the seat next to her. She pulled it over her, and then he scooted over toward her. She shot him a look. Wh what are you doing? Warming you. He pulled her against him. Are you out of your mind running out of the house without a coat? It's five degrees outside. No wonder she thought she was going to die out there. She wanted to argue with him, but he'd opened his coat and drew her against his chest, and he was so damn warm all she could think about was the heat of his body. She was shivering uncontrollably now and couldn't seem to stop her teeth from chattering. I'll be f fine in a minute. Then you c can let me go. He rubbed her back and hair, his voice gentle. I know. I will. The snow came down harder now, obliterating her vision of the outside. The heater and their breath fogged the windshield and windows, reminding her of what they used to do in his car to steam up the windows. It had a lot to do with body heat, but not because she'd been stupid and walked outside in the cold. Those thoughts and memories, coupled with being in his arms again, warmed her more than the heater. I... I'm... Shh. Just relax, Riley. Your body is so cold. I'm not going to move this car until you're warm, so you can just listen to me. She was still shaking, so he was probably right. I'm sorry, really sorry. I was out of line. Seems like I'm always hurting you, and I never meant to. The things I said were unforgivable. It was a knee-jerk reaction. 
more like a jerk reaction. He laughed, the sound deep and vibrating against his chest. You're right there. I was a total jerk. For some reason, you bring out the worst in me. Gee, thanks. Not what I meant. God, Riley, I just make a mess of things when I'm around you, don't I? You seem to. She wasn't going to let him off easy, not this time. If you don't want me to talk to the television people, I won't. She listened to his heart beating against his chest, so strong and sure. She had always believed in Ethan. From the time she was fourteen years old, he'd been her rock, her lifeline, and everything she'd loved. Until Amanda. She'd been running away from the answer for so long, it was time to stop and just ask the damn question. Tell me about Amanda. She felt his heart speed up. What do you want to know? She lifted her head and met his curious, wary gaze. Why did you choose her over me? I didn't even know you were interested in her. He offered up a half-smile. I wasn't. She wanted me. Riley frowned. No, she didn't. Honey, she had a thing for me for years. She wanted me as much as she wanted the career you ended up with. She shook her head. That's not true. I mean, yes, she was a singer, too. A great singer. Of course that's the career she was after. Riley and Amanda had met in choir freshman year. Amanda had a beautiful voice, clear and strong. Her parents had spent a fortune on private lessons. Amanda intended to go to college and study music. Fame was in her future, she'd told Riley. She wanted to front a rock band or become a pop star. She had the chops for it. Riley had been mesmerized by Amanda's voice. They'd spent hours together at Amanda's house, harmonizing on songs. They'd become friends and had been inseparable in all things. Except Amanda had never had a boyfriend. She said she was too busy with her singing lessons to worry about boys, but she'd never begrudged Riley's relationship with Ethan because Riley had always included her. She'd never shut Amanda out, had always tried to fix her up with guys so they could double date. Amanda went, though it was half-hearted. Nothing ever came of those dates. Amanda never seemed intrigued enough by any of the guys to end up with a boyfriend, though she was beautiful, with mink-brown hair, emerald green eyes, and her captivating voice. She never told me she was interested in you. She never even dated anyone long-term in high school. I didn't know. Ethan nodded. She didn't want you to know. She was so jealous of you, Riley, of your voice, your relationship with me. You had everything she wanted. No, that's not true. That's not the Amanda I knew. Ethan sighed. There were parts of her you never knew about. Hell, I didn't even know about them until after you were gone. Like what? She couldn't believe the things he was telling her about Amanda. Like her fear that you were more talented than she was, that her voice would never measure up to yours. How can that be? I'd never had training, and she'd been taking voice lessons her whole life. Her singing was beautiful. He swept her hair away from her face. You've been in the business long enough to know that all the lessons in the world can't compete with raw ability. That's what you had, Riley. You might not have had all the training she had, but you had natural talent, and no training can compare to that. And when it was clear your talent would outshine her, that you were destined for big things, she decided to take the one thing from you she knew she could. Riley almost couldn't say the word out loud, but knew she had to know the truth. You, he nodded. How? You sure you want to know all of it? Yes, because she refused to believe that Ethan loved her one day and just decided to switch to Amanda the next. Though she had believed it, hadn't she? She'd spent the past ten years believing it. Maybe it was time she let Ethan tell her what really happened. She called me one night in tears. It was right after graduation, and she said she'd been turned down for a scholarship to Juilliard, the one and only place she really wanted to go. But she'd gotten so many scholarships to so many different schools. She could have chosen from, what, five or six?
He shrugged. I didn't really know what she was talking about, but you know we'd all gotten close. She was always where you were, so I considered her a friend. I trusted her. I don't remember where you were. She said she couldn't get hold of you and there was no one else to talk to, so I went over there to give her some comfort because she was pretty freaked out. We were drinking beer, then whiskey. Her parents were gone, and you know Amanda always had a lot of freedom and access to whatever she wanted. And then we were drinking a lot. I was trying to make her feel better. It was stupid. We were talking and talking, and I thought I had relaxed her by making her laugh. Hell, I was drunk as hell. Next thing I know, it's morning. I wake up in bed with Amanda naked next to me, and you're standing there. Did you have sex with her? He shrugged. No. At least, I don't think I did, but maybe I did. I don't even remember what happened that night. Does it matter? I shouldn't have put myself in the position to be alone with her. I should have called you right away. I shouldn't have been there drinking with her. It was stupid, and I let her manipulate me. But I had to take responsibility for being there, even if nothing happened. I knew from the look in your eyes you believed what you saw. She had believed it. She and Amanda had plans that morning, plans Amanda had organized. She'd walked into Amanda's room and found the boy she loved naked in bed with her best friend. She'd believed right away what she saw, put two and two together and figured Ethan had slept with Amanda, that Ethan had seduced her best friend. She'd assumed she hadn't been enough for him, that he'd wanted what Amanda could offer him. And she'd never spoken to either of them again. Hurt and rage had taken over, and she'd left town the next day without asking for explanations, without seeing Ethan again. It had been a knee-jerk reaction, a youthful reaction. So she manipulated us both, I guess. Why did you marry her? She was pregnant. And it was mine, or so she told me. You got proof? She showed me the pregnancy test. I had no choice but to believe her. You said it yourself. She was never around other guys. Her eyes widened. You mean she got pregnant after that night? Yeah, I guess, because I didn't sleep with her again after that. So you did have sex with her? He laughed. I have no idea. I don't think I did. If I did, I sure as hell don't remember it, but I wasn't 100% confident, so I was kind of stuck. I couldn't deny I was in bed with her that morning. What about her scholarship? Did she really lose it? Doubtful. I think she was just afraid she'd never be as good as you. And she'd taken me away from you, so that was her triumph. So I married her. And then she miscarried a couple months later. I'm sorry, Ethan. He dragged his fingers through his hair and laughed. <laughs> you know what? So was I at the time. As hurt and angry as I was with her, I was still upset when she lost the baby. I didn't love her, but I wanted the kid. You didn't love her? No, I never loved her. I did what was right and took responsibility. I screwed up and I paid the price for making a mess of my life. But I was in love with you, not her. Riley's heart squeezed. She so wanted to believe that. But you stayed married to her. He let out a short laugh. <sighs> yeah, I did. Why? He lifted his gaze to hers, the pain in his eyes so raw she wanted to run from it. Because when I commit to someone, I honor that commitment. I said I was going to be with her until death do us part. That meant something to me. Riley blinked back the tears. That was Ethan. Once he had committed to her, he'd stuck by her side. Until she'd left him, hadn't allowed him to explain what happened that night with Amanda. Did you ever love her? I'd like to say yes. You knew her. She might have been a little spoiled, but she had her moments— she was fun and a little wild and crazy, and she could be so sweet and loving. And then we had Zoe. Riley smiled. Zoe is amazing. She is. I'll always be grateful to Amanda for giving me Zoe.
She's the best part of my life, and Amanda was a wonderful mother. She seemed to settle after we had Zoe. It was almost as if she'd found what she was searching for. And then she got sick. He nodded. It devastated her, knowing she was going to leave Zoe behind. She felt as if that was somehow a punishment for all the lying and hurt she'd caused. Riley's throat constricted. Oh, God, that's not fair. She didn't think it was either. Neither did I. But we weren't in charge. And Zoe lost her mother. Riley felt sick inside. I'm so sorry, Ethan. For you, for Amanda, and for Zoe. I'm the one who's sorry. There are so many things I could have done differently that night. When Amanda called, I should have called you to see what was up. I could have tried to find you to make you come over there with me. I didn't do that. I just assumed what Amanda said, that you weren't home. And when you ran off that morning after finding us together, I went after you. God, I spent days trying to find you. Riley's heart stuttered. You did? Of course I did. I searched everywhere. I didn't know where you went. I was crazy worried about you. But then I thought, you know what? Maybe you're better off without me. Maybe this is for the best. I was such a fucking coward letting you go. I should have tried harder to find you. Oh, Ethan, I didn't know you came looking for me. He shrugged. It wasn't enough. I should have tried harder. But look at you now. Look at what you've done with your life. If I had found you, you might never have all you have now. I can't regret that for you, you know? Sometimes, destiny plays a big part in things. Maybe I was supposed to screw this all up so you could become famous. She tilted her head. Is that some kind of twisted logic? Maybe. It's not an excuse, though. All of this is my fault. And I'll never be able to say I'm sorry enough times to make it stop hurting you. I know that. But I'm still sorry. I'm sorry for hurting you and for what happened with Amanda. She saw him in a new light. That's a load of heavy burdens you're carrying. His lips curled. I have wide shoulders. Her eyes filled with tears. We both lost so much. Time. Friends. People we loved. But you can't change the past. It is what it is, and I have to live with it. She shuddered, realizing that no matter how much she wanted to go back, Ethan was right. She threw her arms around him and hugged him, needing to give him comfort and forgiveness. And maybe she needed to give herself a little comfort, too, for all she'd lost. Ethan wrapped his arms around Riley while she cried, held her while she grieved for the friends she'd had and lost. He'd long ago cried all he could for losing Amanda. He might not have loved her like a husband should love his wife, but he'd been a good husband to her, a good friend, and he'd never felt guilty for still being in love with Riley after all these years, because while he'd been married to Amanda, she'd been the only woman in his life. Their lives might not have been perfect, but he'd given her all of himself for the time they had together. And the two of them had given Zoe the best life they could. After Riley cried it out, he reached into the glove compartment and handed her a box of tissues. She wiped her eyes, blew her nose, and tossed the coat aside. Now I'm hot, he laughed. Feeling better now? She nodded. I'm sorry, I'm not usually this dramatic. You probably think I'm some Nashville diva who throws fits and storms out of houses and... Oh, God! She lifted tear-filled eyes to his. What your family must think of me. Actually, they thought I was an asshole. They did? Why? Because I was the one who came at you and said all the wrong things. My mother gave me... The look. Yikes, not the look. Yeah, I realized I'd stuck my foot in my mouth right away, but you'd already run out. By the time I ran after you, you were gone. Damn, woman, you're fast. She laughed. I run for exercise. I went inside to grab my coat, and that's when I saw yours... So I got my keys and came looking for you. 
So, no, my family isn't mad at you. They're mad as hell at me. Trust me, I'm in no hurry to go back there. She settled back against the seat, only to find his arm draped back there. She was plenty warm now, and he could have shifted back over to his side of the car, but he hadn't yet. Not that she was complaining. She felt like they'd finally gotten past the huge chasm that had stood between them for all these years, at least the one she'd put there. She tilted her head back and looked into his eyes. God, she could get lost there. She'd spent all of the past ten years on her work, hadn't had time for a serious romance. She hadn't taken time to look for a man in her life, because first she'd been heartbroken over Ethan, and then she'd put all her energies into building her career. There just never seemed to be light left at the end of the day for love. Writing about it, singing about it, yes. Finding it, no. And maybe she'd been afraid to fall in love, because love could hurt. With the paparazzi dogging her every move, her life was under a microscope. She couldn't imagine trying to have her love life scrutinized the same way her career had been. Men in her life had been brief, never anything long-term. But here in Deer Lake, time had seemed to slow down the past few days. No one followed her, probably because they knew she was kind of boring. And really, what would they see? It wasn't like she was in Los Angeles or even Nashville, where the possibility of her hooking up with another country music star, or even a movie or television star, meant a photo op that could generate some buzz. Here there was nothing happening, at least to the film and print media. But for Riley, as she leaned against Ethan's arm and stared into his eyes, there was plenty happening. A shift in her entire perspective had occurred within a matter of days and hours. Now what was she supposed to think? Everything she'd believed to be true had been a lie. Old grudges had slipped away, her protective armor torn off, leaving her naked and raw and not sure what to do about feelings she'd kept buried for all these years. They'd suddenly roared to life again, but it was ten years later. Surely she couldn't still feel the same. Ethan didn't feel the same. He'd lived a whole different life while she was gone. He had a child now, different responsibilities. They'd both grown up and grown apart. But as he swept his hand across her cheek and cupped her neck, his touch sent skittering sensation throughout her body. Her skin flushed with heat. It might not be love, but the spark was still there, and she needed to explore it. She raised her hand and brushed her fingers across the beard stubble on his jaw, shuddering at the raw desire that filled every part of her from the simple touch of her fingers to his face. Ethan brushed his lips to hers, a tentative kiss meant to test and explore. The shock of meeting his lips curled her toes. It was an explosion from within, and there was nothing tentative about her reaction. She grabbed his jacket and pulled him to her, letting him know that soft and gentle wasn't at all what she needed. Not when she had ten years of pent-up passion to release. She tangled her fingers in his hair and pressed her lips to his, deepening the kiss, taking control and letting him know she wanted more. Suddenly, she was on her back on the seat, Ethan looming over her, all his guy parts lined up against all her girl parts, and it felt so damn good to be this close to a man again. Not just any man. Ethan, the first boy she'd loved. Only he wasn't a boy now, evidenced by the thickness of his muscles, the wide chest, and the oh-so-hard evidence of what kissing him and touching him was doing to him. She could write a song about how good this felt, but she doubted it would ever see airtime. Instead, she concentrated on how he held her, his hand slipping underneath her to cup her butt and lift her against that, oh my God, part of him that reminded her they weren't kids anymore making out in the front or back seat of his car. This was adult stuff, and she was ready to act like an adult with him. She'd been robbed of that back then because she hadn't been ready yet, but she was sure as hell ready to consummate now. Right now, in fact. Parked along the curb in front of who knew whose house. Frankly, she didn't care, because Ethan had one hand tangled in her hair, and the other was rubbing her backside 
while his mouth was doing delicious things to hers, and she was afraid she might just have an orgasm right there before any clothes got undone. And then he vibrated. Whoa, he was really talented. And if she shifted just a little to the left, those vibrations. Damn it, he said, lifting his head. My phone's ringing. He shifted, climbing off her, and for the first time in a while, she felt cold. Seriously, can't you ignore it? He gave her a regretful smile. It could be about Zoe. Sorry, give me just a second. He checked the display. Shit. He pressed a button and put the phone to his ear. Hi, mom. Wow, it was ten years ago. Ethan rolled his eyes. No, I found her. She's fine. We're just sitting here, talking. While he listened, he gave her a look that sent her up in flames again. Yeah, I'm going to bring her back shortly. Okay. He pressed the button and tossed the phone on the dash, then dragged his fingers through his hair. Sorry, kind of lost myself there for a minute. Riley shuddered out a sigh, realizing whatever had been about to happen or might have happened wasn't going to. Not here, not tonight. It's okay. I did too. I'll drive you back to my parents. The only good thing was Ethan looked as frustrated and regretful as she did. He hit the defrosters and the windshield wipers, and by the time everything cleared, Riley realized how much snow had fallen already. They took a slow drive back to the house, giving Riley a chance to fix her hair and put on some lip gloss, so she didn't look quite so ravaged by the time Ethan pulled into the driveway. They made a mad dash to the house where Ethan's mom was waiting with the door open. It's horrible outside. I was so worried about you. She enveloped Riley in a hug. I already sent Brody and Wyatt home, which is where you both need to go before this gets any worse. Yes, Mom. Ethan said with a roll of his eyes, then a laugh and a kiss. I'm sorry we didn't get to spend more time together. I blame my son for that. She glared at Ethan. Already discussed and apologized, Mom. Topics closed. Okay, okay. You two get on the road. I've driven in snow before. I have a four-wheel drive, Mom. And I'm still your mother, and I'm going to worry. You should drive Riley back to her place. I have an SUV too, Mrs. Kent. And at her look, corrected it to, Stacy, I'm sure I'll be fine, but thank you. I'll follow her, Ethan said, to make sure she makes it there safe. That'll make me feel better. She hugged Riley and Ethan, and they were out the door. Snow pelted her on the face as the wind picked up. Wow, it's really coming down. Really, do you need me to drive you back to the B and B? No, it's not that far. I can make it. Okay. He seemed as reluctant to let her go as she was to be let go of, but since Ethan's mother was peeking through the blinds, she opened her car door. I'll see you later. Yeah, later. She started the car up. She hadn't thought about gloves because she was a moron, so gripping the icy cold steering wheel was torture. But she managed to back out of the driveway and made the trek back to the bed and breakfast. She had to admit it gave her some comfort to see Ethan's SUV behind her the whole way. When she pulled into the parking lot and turned off the car, he waited in the street until she opened the front door and went inside. Only then did he drive off. Leaving her aching and frustrated, and alone, she sighed and turned off the lights. Chapter Seven. There was a holiday celebration at Town Square tonight, with Christmas carolers, ice skating on the makeshift rink, a parade, and of course Santa. It was one of Zoe's favorite parts of the holiday. Though Ethan wasn't sure if it was because of all the events that took place at Town Square, or because she knew that meant Christmas was only a couple days away. Either way, he loved watching the joy in her eyes. He fed off her excitement, and this was the event that always got him in the mood for Christmas. Because it had snowed, the whole town had a holiday look to it, which made everything perfect. 
wreaths hung on every streetlight, banners and lights decorated every storefront, and with the seven inches of snow they'd gotten, the entire town looked like something out of a Christmas movie. Zoe had spent the past couple days building snowmen in the yard, complete with black button eyes, tattered scarves, carrot noses, and red gumdrops for the mouths. It had stayed cold enough that Mr. and Mrs. Snow People were still standing, which thrilled Zoe even more, and thankfully had given her something to do, so she hadn't bugged him nonstop about when Christmas was. The only drawback to this extravaganza was that Riley would be singing. Not that there was anything wrong with her singing. It was just that he'd been kind of avoiding her since two nights ago in the car, when he totally lost his mind and climbed all over her. Fortunately, she'd been busy wrapping up all her biography stuff since then, and he hadn't run into her. Today was supposed to be her last event, a filmed thing where she would sing a medley of Christmas songs from her last holiday CD. Everyone from town would be there. Riley would sing after the parade. And then she and her entire crew would pack up and go, along with all the media. So, really, what had been the point of refiring the past between them, except to remind him that the two of them were worlds apart, and he still couldn't have her? He didn't deserve to have her. Besides, there was Zoe to think about. Her life was here in Deer Lake, where his family was, where Zoe's family was. Riley's life was somewhere else, probably always on the road on that big tour bus of hers. And even though he'd driven home the long way to get his riotous libido under control that night, and he'd been thinking about Riley nonstop ever since, especially about that hot interlude in the car and how it had felt to remap her body with his hands, it was pointless. She was going her way soon, and he was staying here with his daughter. So, despite wanting to call her the next day or go over to the bed and breakfast to see her, he hadn't, because his life was reality, not fantasy. And since Riley had left, the icy cold hand of reality had firmly clenched him in its grip. Daddy, I want to go ice skating. He looked down at his adorable daughter, who looked like a puffy pink marshmallow in her pink coat, pink hat, and pink mittens. He'd done her hair in pigtail braids this morning, and she'd insisted on puffy pink bands to hold them. She even wore pink boots. The girl liked her some pink. We'll go ice skating later. The parade's about to start. You don't want to miss it, do you? Her eyes got big and wide. Oh no! Let's go, Daddy. She tucked on his hand and dragged him toward the center island of town where the parade ended. They were lucky and found a bench to sit on. A perfect viewing area for the parade. They were joined shortly by his mom and dad and brothers. It's cold as a well digger's Brody. His mother warned, casting her glance to Zoe. Shovel, Brody finished with a tweak of Zoe's nose. Zoe giggled. Wyatt shoved his hands in his pockets, turned up the collar of his coat, and looked about as happy to be there as he would be if he was having a root canal. But missing the annual town Christmas event would somehow be a direct insult to their mother, and even Wyatt wouldn't do that, no matter how much he hated the world these days. When you lived in a small town, parades weren't exactly like the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade in New York City. They didn't go on for hours. You had the cops because they could run their sirens, and all the kids liked that, and the fire department too. Then there were the middle school and high school bands. A few local clubs like Rotary and Knights of Columbus, some private organizations and businesses who put some holiday floats together, and that was pretty much it. And then came Santa on his big float at the end, waving from on top of his makeshift chimney. Dave Bowman was doing a fine job as Santa this year, and Ethan suspected Dave's rosy cheeks were due to the shot or two of whiskey Ethan had seen him downing at McGuffey's Tavern prior to the start of the parade. The Santa float was always the biggest hit with the kids, since Santa's elves tossed candy. There was Tori dressed as an elf in her green stockings and short skirt, her flaming red hair a perfect complement to the whole elf gig. Damn, Brody whispered. Her skirt is short enough that every time she bends over, you can see. Brody whistled instead. Tori shot him an evil glare and threw candy at his head. Maybe you shouldn't look. Ethan suggested, and maybe I should. 
Brody unwrapped the candy, popped it in his mouth, and walked away. The parade over, the crowds milled around for a while. Zoe amused herself by playing a few games, ice skating, and, of course, eating. Chairs were being set up at the town center gazebo area for Riley's concert. The television crews were in hot turnout today, no doubt because it was the weekend and that meant people from surrounding areas would come, increasing attendance. Great. Good for the town, Ethan supposed, but it just meant more crowds. Riley Jensen is going to sing today, Daddy. He smiled indulgently at his daughter. I know. There's no backstage today because she's going to sing on a stage that has no back. Zoe giggled. So I noticed. We'll just hang out here and listen, okay? Do you think Riley Jensen will see us all the way back here? It's kind of far. I think she'll probably be a little busy, but maybe she'll be looking for you. You can stand on your chair and wave to her while she's singing, but no talking because that would be rude. Okay, Daddy. When it looked like people were starting to claim seats, Ethan moved in with his parents and brothers. Tori had joined them too, along with one of her friends. They made it about three quarters of the way back, since it was pretty well packed in. Damn, there were a lot of people here. Daddy, I can't see. Zoe whined. His kid needed a nap. As soon as Riley finished singing, they were out of here. It's the best we can do, Muffin. He said, tugging on one of her pigtails. Sorry. Then his phone buzzed. An unfamiliar number. Hey, Ethan, it's Joanne, Riley's publicist. Are you here at the festival? Uh, yeah. Riley has the front row saved for you and your family if you want to watch the concert. Oh, we're already seated, kind of in the back. Then come on up front. I'll be waiting here to seat you. Okay. He hung up and turned to his mom. That was Riley's publicist. She has the front row saved for us. Oh, isn't that nice? His mom said, then herded the family up and out of their chairs and toward the front row. Zoe, of course, was thrilled, and the view was much better up here in the front row. What he didn't care for was having to endure knowing looks, encouraging nods and smirks from everyone as they made their way up there. Great. Hey, didn't know you and Riley were back together. Mark Roberts patted him on the back. Nice going, man. We're just so thrilled for you and Riley, Ethan. Callie Roberts said. Ethan half turned. It's not like that. She likes Zoe and wanted to make sure she could see. Plus, she's known my parents for a long time. Callie gave him a sly grin. Sure, honey. Whatever you say. Ugh. Zoe was bouncing in her seat, waiting for the concert to begin, and telling everyone around her that she was Riley Jensen's new best friend. Even his own mother had gotten into the act, sharing that he and Riley had gone out alone together the other night. Maybe Ethan could just slip out and go home. But then Riley and her band came out, and damn if his libido didn't tie him to the chair, because she looked gorgeous in tight blue jeans. Sinfully sexy thigh-high boots, a wide-open suede jacket, and a shirt that clung to her curves. She'd worn her hair down. It swept her shoulders in loose waves, and all he could think about was how good she'd smelled the other night when he'd held her close and kissed her and touched her. And oh man, he was sitting next to his mother and thinking about having sex with Riley. He was probably going straight to hell for that. At least this time she wasn't singing about him. It was all Christmas songs, and Zoe couldn't help but sing along, despite his mother's best attempts to admonish her to stay quiet. But Riley smiled down at Zoe, since his daughter wasn't exactly a quiet singer. Fortunately, she did have a great voice, and Riley finally motioned to her to join her on stage. And since his daughter didn't have a shy bone in her entire body. She got to stand with the choir and sing her little heart out along with Riley and the choir. His mother took approximately ten thousand pictures, plus video. Ethan had to admit he was pretty excited about it too, though it wasn't like he thought of Riley as a celebrity. She was just Riley. But he was always thrilled to see his daughter happy, and Zoe was grinning from ear to ear, 
especially when one of the choir angels put her halo on Zoe's head. Zoe probably wouldn't touch ground from her happy place for at least twenty-four hours. After the concert, Zoe jumped into his arms. Did you see me, Daddy? I got to sing on the stage. I saw you. You were awesome. Did you hear me? I sang really loud. He laughed as Riley joined them. I had no problem hearing you. Riley rubbed Zoe's back. This young lady has a beautiful voice, just like her mama did. Zoe frowned. Did you know my mama, Riley Jensen? Riley lifted her chin, and Ethan could tell she fought tears. I did. She was my best friend in high school. Wow! Zoe turned to Ethan. I didn't know that, Daddy. Did you know that? I did. He put Zoe down and lifted his gaze to Riley. You did a nice job out there tonight. Thanks. I'm just glad all this is over with. She swept her gaze over the camera crews who were packing up. Everyone leaving? They are. He frowned. You're not. She shrugged. I've sprung my people loose. Figured I'd hang out here until after the holidays and write some music. By yourself? His mother asked. Riley smiled. Yes, everyone has their families to go home to. I plan to stay and enjoy the solitude. I do my best songwriting that way. No one to hover over me, and no place I have to be. What she hadn't said, Ethan noted, was that Riley had no family to go home to for Christmas. You'll come to our house for Christmas, his mother said, taking the words right out of his mouth. Riley's eyes widened, and she shook her head. Oh no, I couldn't. I wasn't trying to wrangle an invitation. I really do intend to just spend a couple weeks alone and write. That's just fine, dear. You do that. On Christmas Eve, you'll come over for dinner and games. Christmas morning, we have pancakes for breakfast, turkey for dinner. You won't be spending Christmas alone. Riley slanted a helpless gaze his way. No use arguing with her. You know how she is. If you don't come over, she'll just send one of us to fetch you. She inhaled and let out a sigh, then smiled. Of course. Thank you, Stacy. I'd love to come over for Christmas. Ethan wondered how many holidays Riley had spent alone the past ten years. She'd never come home before, so he had no idea where she'd spent her Thanksgivings and Christmases. It would be interesting spending Christmas with her. And okay, maybe he was thinking about carving out some time to be alone with her. They might not have a future together, but they had right now. He looked down at Zoe, who leaned against his mother and yawned. Mom, why don't you and Dad take Zoe home? She looks tired. I'd like to hang out with Riley for a bit. He knew his mother would jump all over that one. Of course. Come on, little miss. Time for bed for you. Ethan picked up Zoe and gave her a kiss. Night, Daddy. Night, Muffin. She turned sleepy eyes on Riley. Night, Riley Jensen. I love you. Riley's eyes sparkled with tears as she pulled Zoe into her arms. Good night, Zoe. I love you too. As they walked away, Riley lifted her eyes to Ethan. She's an amazing child. You're very lucky. Thanks. I think so. And she really does have a beautiful voice, so clear and perfectly on key. She gets that from Amanda because, if you recall, I can't sing for shit. Riley laughed. Your singing is great. At his dubious look, she said, "Hey, at least you sing on key." Okay, maybe that. But Nashville isn't going to come calling to offer me a record deal anytime soon, so I'm grateful Zoe got her singing genes from her mom. Me too. He looked around and realized it had gotten dark. The crowds had thinned. Was there something you wanted to talk to me about? She asked. No. He took her hand. I want to take you ice skating. Her brows lifted and she grinned. Really? Yeah. I haven't been ice skating in years. Good. The rink had been poured in the middle of town on one of the grassy fields behind the high school. Ethan had a hand in prepping and building it, and God knows it was plenty cold enough to sustain it.
Proceeds from the sale of admissions and concessions would be split between the women's shelter and the new field stands at the high school. I'm not sure I even remember how to skate, Riley said as she finished lacing up. Oh, come on, you never forget. You were always good at it. <laughs> I think it's something you definitely forget. Plus, I'm a lot older now. He rolled his eyes and took her hand as they headed over to the ice entrance. You're still plenty young, and you bounce around on that stage like you're fifteen, so don't give me any of that older now crap. Let's skate. He rolled out onto the ice and turned to face her. She gave him an arched brow hanging onto the entrance. I don't bounce. He laughed and held out his hand. Yeah, you do. Like you have springs on your feet. If you don't believe me, check out concert footage. Now come on. She took his hand and tentatively slid out onto the rink. She was a little wobbly at first as she fought for balance, but he held on to her, his hand around her waist. Not that he minded holding her close. Do you remember ice skating at the park on Friday nights? She grinned up at him, slipped, and her eyes widened. I've got you. I won't let you fall. She stared up at him, and her eyes, so clear and full of trust, were like a punch to his gut. They glided along, and she finally got her balance. Yes, I remember skating nights in the winter. You, me, Amanda, all our friends. Even on the coldest nights, we'd skate, then have hot chocolate and pretzels. He laughed, remembering it. You and Amanda would try to lead the whip and fail miserably. She pulled out of his grasp, finally confident enough to skate on her own, though she stayed close enough to grab onto his arm whenever she started to wobble. Hey, we were good at the whip. You sucked at it and made everyone crash into the wall. We did not. You have a faulty memory. When you led, you deliberately crashed us into the wall. Now who has the faulty memory? I whipped you all around until you squealed like girls. She giggled. Those were fun times. Ethan turned and skated backwards, facing her. Show off. Zoe can do it too. Oh sure, make me feel bad. We skate at the park a lot. She lifted her gaze to his, her hand on his arm. Did she even realize she leaned on him? Probably not. The rink is still open. Yeah, Zoe loves to skate. She and Amanda. It's okay, Ethan. You can talk about her. She and Amanda love to skate together on the weekends. His chest felt tight. Riley moved to the sidewall and held on. Ethan followed. Does it hurt you to talk about her? Not really. The pain is mostly past now. I just don't want to hurt you. She shook her head. I want to know about her, about the two of you and your life with Zoe. There's so much I missed out on. He tucked an errant hair into her hat. I think that would just be uncomfortable for you. She shrugged. We can't pretend it didn't happen. The best thing to do is get it all out in the open and talk about it. Then there won't be any more secrets between us. And then what? He wanted to ask, but didn't. Because there would be no then what. Riley was looking for closure and nothing more. He owed her that much. What do you want to know? Tell me about your life with Amanda. He shrugged. Not much to tell. We got married, struggled at first. We had to get jobs, work full time, and I was trying to take classes too. Then it was hard after she miscarried. There was a lot of mistrust. I didn't believe she was pregnant in the first place, and she knew it. But once she showed me proof of her pregnancy, I was committed. So we worked at the marriage day by day. Did you believe the baby was yours? No, I asked her for a DNA test. We were going to do the test, but she had to be farther along. Then she miscarried before we could make it happen. So I'll never know if the baby was mine or not, if there was a baby. That must have been difficult for both of you. Hard to have a relationship without trust. It is. But eventually she mellowed. Wasn't as high strung as she'd been when you knew her. Riley nodded. A lot of that came from her parents pushing her so hard. They wanted everything for her. He smiled. 
That didn't stop. They were so pissed about the whole pregnancy and marriage thing, accused me of seducing her and trapping her here. They hated me. Riley stepped off the ice and Ethan followed. They took off their skates and turned them in. Let's order a pizza and head back to the B&B &B to continue this talk. Unless you have to be somewhere else? Do you have to pick up Zoe? No, she's fine at my mom's. I'll just call her and have her keep Zoe for the night. Okay. Once they got the pizza, they went to the bed and breakfast. Since Riley had rented the place out and all her people had left, she was alone. Aren't Bill and Macy here? No, they're vacationing for the holidays in Colorado with their kids. We took over the whole house from them. So you're entirely alone in this big place? She grinned and grabbed plates from the kitchen cabinet, then laid out slices of pizza. All by myself. You have no idea how awesome that is. I'm never alone. Huh. Never thought about that. You probably have people around you all the time. She dug into a slice and moaned. You have no idea. Oh, this is good. Katarina's is a new place, opened up about a year ago. Kat's family is from Italy, and let me tell you, every pizza they make is amazing. Riley looked as if she'd died and gone to heaven. She dug into the pizza as if she hadn't eaten in a week. They each had a beer and didn't talk much while they enjoyed their food. Okay, she said as she wiped her mouth with a napkin. So, Amanda's parents hated you because they thought you trapped their daughter into marriage. He took a long pull off the bottle of beer, then set it down. Yeah, Amanda tried to tell them it wasn't my fault, but you know how they were. Yeah, I know. They weren't fond of me either. Thought I wasn't the right kind of friend for their daughter. They always thought they were more upper crust than they actually were. I mean, this is Deer Lake, not Boston or New York. And yeah, her father came from money, but he was no industry giant either. She shrugged. Amanda was never influenced by it. A little spoiled, but she and I had always been great friends. I still can't believe she was jealous of me. She was. She had a great voice, but it could never match yours. She was envious. And when you went off and became famous, she was so jealous. She wanted your life in a way that I don't think she ever got over. Riley pushed her beer aside, then lifted her gaze to his. But she had you, so which one of us was the real winner? Ethan stared at her. He had no words, no answer for what she'd just said. Riley. What he saw in her eyes was truth and forgiveness, which was what he needed more than anything but didn't deserve. He reached out and took her hand, swirling his thumb over the softness of her skin. In his line of work, he dealt with steel and wood and only the roughest raw materials. But the raw material that was Riley was nothing short of perfection. She was silk and gloss, her skin a creamy glow. Not even the harsh fluorescent lights of the kitchen could spoil her beauty. The way her eyes caught and reflected so much of who she was... He saw such innocence there, and such strength. She'd been through so much, had forged her destiny on her own with no one backing her or pushing her to succeed. Satin over steel. Ethan, she whispered, and he saw need and desire, no longer the girl she once was, but a woman. A woman he wanted. He stood, pulling her into his arms, his mouth covering hers, drawing in her gasp, then her moan. All he'd been thinking about since that night in the car was kissing her again, touching her again, feeling her body pressed against his. She slid her hands in his hair and tugged, igniting his passion like dry timber catching fire. All the careful consideration he'd given about keeping his distance went up in a puff of smoke as soon as their lips met. They crashed together, her hands went under his shirt, and the logical part of his mind went blank. All thought fled south, and the thinking part of his brain settled firmly in his pants. He wanted Riley. Hell, he'd always wanted her. And now he was going to have her. 
They had the house to themselves, the night to themselves, and nothing was going to stop this now. A bombardment of sensations made Riley's breath catch. Ethan's scent, fresh soap mingled with the crisp outdoors, the satiny steel of his chest as she held on to him for support, his groan as he kissed her. She buried her face in his chest as he pushed her up against the kitchen wall. Oh my, this was hard passion, a need that had gone too long without being met. Their mouths and tongues tangled while they fumbled with clothing. Boots were kicked off in a hurry, and she grabbed for the button of his jeans while he reached for hers. The only sounds in the quiet house, their own harsh breaths, as they fought to get each other undressed. Ethan fumbled for the buttons on her flannel shirt, then ripped them, the sound of buttons flying across the wood floor only adding fuel to her steadily rising fire. She raised his shirt over his head, taking a few seconds to marvel at the sculpted abs, the wide expanse of his shoulders and chest. That's all he'd give her before he kissed her again hard, shoving her back against the wall and lifting her legs. She wrapped them around him, hard meeting soft. He ripped her panties, and she delighted in the feral hunger he had for her. She tangled her fingers in his hair and tugged as he entered her, making her cry out with the sheer delight of feeling him inside her. This was what she'd wanted her whole life, what she'd needed. This connection, this fire. Ethan... She came almost immediately and rode the wave while he pushed her to the edge again and again, his mouth on her lips, her throat, his tongue blazing a trail of hot sensations she could barely endure but never wanted to end. And when she climbed to the edge and fell over again, he fell with her, this time his mouth taking hers in a searing kiss that left them both shaky and breathless. And still he held her, the corded muscles of his arms able to take her weight as he balanced her against the wall. When she could find her voice again, all she could manage was, Wow. Sorry, not a finessed moment. She swept his hair off his brow. It was a wow moment. It was perfect. He grinned, kissed her, and set her down. Riley fixed them something to drink, then they gathered their clothes and went upstairs to the bedroom. Ethan seemed comfortable wandering the house naked. Then again, why not? It was just the two of them, and, oh man, he was magnificent. She could tell he worked his body hard, and he had the best ass she'd ever seen. Riley remembered their makeout sessions used to be all hands and mouths and couldn't get enough of each other but they'd never made love. Maybe that's what had hurt so much about finding him in Amanda's bed that morning. Amanda had had him, and she hadn't. She forced thoughts of Amanda out of her head, refusing to let the past intrude on the present. She couldn't go back and change what was. Now was what she was interested in, and right now, Ethan was hers. Only hers. They climbed onto the bed together, and Ethan dragged her against him. Let's try to slow things down this time, he said. I thought last time was pretty good. It was, but I want to touch all of you this time, linger over you. She shuddered out a sigh when he brushed his lips across hers, then drew her in for a hungry kiss that melted her to the sheets. As he slid his fingers up her ribcage, she was afraid she was going to slide right off the bed from the sheer pleasure of it. He pulled his lips away, and she felt consumed by the raw hunger in his eyes, the need she saw reflected there. She'd missed so much with Ethan, had hesitated all those years ago, and she'd lost him. And she might not really have him now. But she was going to have him tonight, even if she didn't tomorrow. She wanted this one night with him, no matter what happened after that. And now it was her chance to explore, too. To lay her palms over his chest and let them wander over the rock-hard steel of his abdomen. The solid, muscular feel of him was so different than when he'd been a boy. 
This was a man's body, the sculpted angles and planes telling her what he did for a living. And below his belly, she wound her fingers around him, rewarded with a slow hiss of his breath. This was a new side to their relationship, the adult side, something they'd never had before. When she was younger, she'd been tentative, innocent, not knowing what to ask for. Now she knew exactly what she wanted. All of him. He rolled her onto her back and climbed on top of her, kissing the spot between her neck and shoulder that drove her crazy, before lazily mapping her body with his lips, from her collarbone to her breasts. And when he reached her breasts, he took his damn sweet time, torturing her with nips and kisses and bites that had her arching her back and crying out for more. Bastard! She loved every second of what he did to her, was damp and ready for him again in seconds. She raised her arms out for him, but he only chuckled and laid them on the bed, holding them there while he kissed her ribs, her belly, working his way between her legs, nudging them apart with his shoulders, then putting his mouth on her sex to pleasure her until her mind no longer worked, until her back bowed and she muttered unintelligible words as she cried out with a shattering climax that left her shaking all over. And when his face came into view again, he gave her a satisfied smile, rolled her onto her side facing him, and lifted her leg over his hip. He entered her, and this time it was slow and achingly sweet, at least in the beginning. She touched his face, her fingertips tracing his lips as he stroked her so gently it almost moved her to tears. Having Ethan inside her, being one with him was what she'd always wanted. They were meant to be together like this. Passion rose in a hurry, and soon she was scraping her nails down his arm, and he gripped her hips and drew her hard against his thrusts. It seemed there could be no light and easy between them, because they had held off for too long, and the desire they felt had to be satisfied in the most primal of ways. She demanded, and he gave, and when they both shattered, it was wrapped around each other, bodies, mouths, and souls. They played all night long, stopping only to eat a snack in the pre-dawn hours. They went to sleep, tangled together like two people who'd been apart for so long they never wanted to lose sight of each other. Riley wondered briefly what the next day would bring, then decided she just didn't care, because they'd had tonight, and that's all that mattered. Chapter 8 Ethan spent Christmas Eve morning at the office, something that didn't make his mother too happy but he needed to get a few loose ends tied up. Plus, he just wanted some time alone with his thoughts, since for some reason his mother had let everyone know he'd spent the night with Riley, which meant nudges and winks from Brody and smiles from his dad. Wyatt just shook his head and called him a dumbass. He didn't want any of it, just some peace and quiet to think about what it all meant. After a couple hours of mulling it over, he realized it meant nothing because after Christmas, Riley would be going back to Nashville, where she had a life and a blockbuster career. He'd be staying in Deer Lake, where he had a job, a family, and a daughter to raise. The fact he was still in love with her didn't enter the picture of her world at all, nor should it. He knew he should have kept his distance. In fact, it would have been better if he hadn't seen her at all. Then all the old feelings he'd had for her wouldn't have come rushing back. It was payback for hurting her, because when she left, it was going to hurt like hell, and it was going to be just like ten years ago all over again. The heartbreak he'd experienced when he'd gone out searching and couldn't find her, couldn't explain to her what had happened. The loss, the anguish, the wish that he could find her and bring her back home. But this wasn't her home anymore, and never would be again. What would she do in a tiny town like Deer Lake? What did Ethan have to offer her now that she was rich and famous? She already had everything. 
There was nothing he had to give her that she didn't already have. He dug into his paperwork and shut down the dumbass thoughts in his head. Riley had spent entirely too much time primping for Christmas Eve. A ridiculous amount of time, considering when she wasn't on tour, she never fussed with her appearance. She loved downtime because it meant no hairdressers or makeup artists hovering around putting false eyelashes on her and doing her hair up to there. So when she had time off, it meant straight hair and no makeup. No high-heeled boots, no glitter, and absolutely nothing with sequins. Absent the glitter, sequins, and high-heeled boots, she had styled her hair and put on makeup. She'd put on her favorite pair of black jeans, a tight sweater, and a pair of fancy boots. She twirled in the mirror and thought about changing clothes, then realized she wasn't going on a date. She was going to Ethan's parents' house to spend Christmas Eve with his entire family. But her heart still fluttered with excitement when the doorbell rang. She ran downstairs, flung the door open, and saw Ethan's smiling face. Hey, he said. Hey, yourself. Despite all they'd shared last night, and again this morning before he'd left, she still didn't know where they stood, until he stepped inside and dragged her into his arms for a body-melting kiss that left her dizzy. Nice to see you too, she said when he let her go. I missed you today. I worked for a while at the office, then had the obligatory help the parents get ready for Christmas Eve thing. How was your day? She loved that he asked as she went to grab her coat. I did a little writing. It was a productive day. He helped her put her coat on, and they walked outside. It was cold, and the skies were dark. No sign of stars. Maybe it would snow for Christmas, which would be delightful. Glad it was a good day for you. She slid into the car and waited for him to get inside. I don't think it could have been anything but a perfect day after last night. The smile he directed at her was. Dazzling, and promising. I'm glad. Still, they hadn't talked about last night or what it had meant, or where they'd go from here. Riley tried not to make more of it than what it was: really great sex between two people who'd known each other for a very long time. And maybe it had seemed like more at the time, more of a soul type connection. But she was both a woman and a songwriter, a lethal combination. Women were emotional by nature, and artists tended to throw their hearts and souls into everything they did, whereas Ethan had probably just wanted to get laid. So she should probably stop turning last night into the holy grail of lovemaking experiences, when to Ethan it had likely just been a night of decent sex. You're kind of quiet over there. He said as they pulled into his parents' driveway. Oh, just thinking of some lyrics. Hard to turn off the job sometimes. He laughed. I know how that is. They went inside, and Riley was assaulted by a three-foot whirlwind with dark hair and a ponytail. Riley Jensen, you're here. Ethan took her coat with an apologetic look and leaned in to whisper, "Sorry, you'll get no peace tonight." She. Kind of adores you," she grinned and whispered back. "It's okay. The feeling is mutual." Miss Zoe, how are you tonight? Did you know Santa is coming tonight? You have to go to bed early, or he won't come to your house. Where is your house, Riley Jensen? I'm staying at the bed and breakfast over on Connor Street. Do you think Santa will be able to find me? Riley said as she and Zoe wandered into the living room. Santa can. Always find you. Everyone was there already. Wyatt and his scowling face, Brody and his amused one, and Ethan's parents, who grinned and enveloped her in a huge hug. They had dinner, then spent the evening playing board games and cards, then watching how the great.